different PKs. So here are some additional considerations for selecting healthy volunteer and the patients. Uh, the first one I already mentioned, right? If your molecule is genotox, no brainer, you have to test that in patient population. And then in general, for healthy volunteers, they do offer a lot of advantage. So for the safety uh, results interpretation, in general, they are very healthy and also they have placebo control. So usually less confounded. So we know the safety we observe is truly from the treatment. But however, in the patient population, because I think the disease also can find the safety assessment. So sometimes it's difficult to dissect the causal effect for the adverse event we observe. It's due to the treatment or it's due to the disease progression. And, and the third, third comparison for healthy volunteer in general is much easier to conduct first in human healthy volunteer study. Usually we have dedicated clinical phase one unit to help implement even very complex protocol. As I showed in earlier, we can build some clean farm study, food effect, BA, et cetera. I think clinical uh, study unit very sophisticated to do these complex protocols. Uh, however, in patients, we usually need to do that clinical trial study in hospitals by specialized physicians. And the given health volunteer not going to bring gain any medical benefit, so you already compensate for their precipitation. But on the other hand, we expect the patient may potentially benefit for this treatment. And so there will be have, have different considerations. And again, for healthy volunteers, uh, you will be re usually require genotox batteries to be able us to do the healthy volunteer studies. Sample size consideration, as I already highlighted earlier in the table, uh, for first in human study, the sample size really small, is around six to eight, even three to six per dose levels, and the ways without placebos depends on the indication. But for the phase two and the phase three, will depends, you know, what your, uh, you know, clinical endpoints. We also need to involve some statistical determination for the sample size calculation. If studies, for example, phase three is confirmatory, confirmatory is what's target, uh, you know, achieve target efficacy benefit compared to standard care, you need to do that sophisticated calculations. And then we also, we also need to determine what's the potential rate of the drop-off rate and uh, what's the replacement policy. Uh, if the patient drop out, we have not really achieved our goal. Do we want to replace them? Um, and also sample size in general will increase uh, when we go to phase two, uh, phase one and phase two and phase three. And the third, and also I want to share a little bit on the schedule uh, schedule assessment. That's an important uh, decision. Usually, is uh, as appendix how much we want to. So the key discussion: how much we want to get of one studies. So again, for the first one studies, mainly safety tolerability. So we usually collect a general set of safety labs, vital sign, ECG, and AE. Additionally, we can also consider collect safety biomarker. Uh, which is mainly driven by the uh, tox findings. And then we also want to collect enough adequate PK samplings to describe the absorption, distribution, and elim elimination, and to allow estimate, uh, estimation of the relevant parameters. And again, you know, given the PK may not necessarily always those proportionals, so you need to consider the, your, your molecules, those characteristics. You may need slightly different sampling schedulings for the different dose levels. And then in the context of PD biomarker, I think the key question, what are the biomarkers available and the, what and the, how relevant they are in the context of for the efficacy and the safety and the, how feasible we can implement this biomarker in the study. And also to set the priorities, I think we can collect a lot of biomarker, but, we, but it's also quite expensive. We need to decide what are the key questions we want to address from the study and prioritize the biomarkers. So just want to briefly highlight some of the biomarker, why we're interested in uh, to collect biomarker data in phase one. Because in the typical, as I mentioned earlier, for the SAD and MAS study, it's usually in healthy volunteers. And uh, we could not evaluate the efficacy. 
So I think the phase one, we only established safety, how we transition from safety to efficacy. So I think a biomarker can are the potential information to bridge the gap. So the biomarker, there's different type of biomarker. So a biomarker can serve as a surrogate endpoint for clinical efficacy, for example, percent target inhibition and set action. So biomarker can also serve as to inform the toxicity and the safety, organ toxicity. For example, for renal toxicity, you can look at the serum creatinines. And the additional biomarker can also use the patient selection, define the patient population. For this type of biomarker, we call uh, CDS, is clinical diagnosis uh, diagnosis biomarkers. So we use that uh, CDS to select the patient population. Again, depends on what's the question, we can select different biomarker to test in the clinical development. So this is our general consideration for the first in human study design. So I just want to share with you a little bit brief flavors on the different unique consideration uh, given most of my work is in, in oncology development. So here are the traditional oncology drug development. So due to the high med medical need, actually oncology doesn't really follow that the traditional phase one, two, three phases. So usually it's accelerated without any much phases. So we have those escalation I'm showing here as an example, and then we can identify the MTD. And then we will just, once we see some uh, efficacy, given this uh, patient population, we once we see some efficacy, we gain the confidence, we will quickly go to the pivotal studies. Sometimes we, if we, if the efficacy is so uh, so, uh, you know, transformative, we don't even need to go to randomized pivotal trials. We can further expand that a uh, dose uh, in that specific population use that single arm study can support registration. So sometimes, for example, PEMBER, they use the large phase one to support registration. So I think, you know, for the uh, traditional oncology uh, development, so I think we need to be agile, adaptive, depends on what we see on the safety and efficacy and decided what's the, the you know, development path for these different molecules. And I also want to briefly introduce, uh, you know, the recent FDA effort on the project Optimus. I think they are really highlight the importance to uh, find a robust dose finding for our quality product. So in the past, because the competition, the speed, usually the people will try to do MTD and then skip to the registration. Um, but however, you know, if you select those too high and the bring unnecessary toxicities, so it may not necessarily benefit the patient, actually uh, really, uh, you know, compromise the benefit that we can bring to the patient population. So as the results, I think the FDA actually introduced another paradigm. So after the right after the dose escalation, they highly encourage the sponsor actually evaluate the multiple dose in the randomized fashion so that we can identify a multiple optimal dose that can further test in the pivotal studies. Again, this is just paradigms. The industry still gradually adapt. We we'll based on their situation, the learnings from the dose escalation, and we will decide whether we want to do the randomized dose finding. And as an example here, I just want to show you one of the phase one uh, first in human study design with one of the ADC is called trisuzumab dirotecan. And the, here are the uh, structures and they HER2 antibody drug conjugate. So this is our typical antibody, which is linked to uh, the uh, peptide uh, linker and the link to the DSD, uh, you know, small molecule, which is a top topoisomers inhibitors. So in this the first in human study have two parts, dose escalation. So as I show typical three plus three study design, we have three patients per dose levels. And then we start to see some anti-tumor effect. Actually, eight mg per kg is not the DLT. So we have so they start to see uh, anti-tumor activity at the five and six mg per kg. And they also start to see some safety signal. As a result, they decided to further expand 5.4 and 6.4 mg per kg dose in the expansion cohort. And again, here they focus on specific population. So HER2 positive breast cancer, gastric cancer, and other HER2 low cancers. So when they talk to FDA, FDA encouraged them to further evaluate 5.4 and 6.4 in the context of efficacy and safety. Um, and in the randomized fashion, and the, based on this data, they select one dose and the further expand at the part two as single arm study. Eventually, this study along the phase one study support accelerated approval for in her two. 
And uh, again, I think the I just want to share a little bit of flavor what analysis I, they have been done to support those selection at the time they finished randomized those findings. So they're basically pulling the data with the phase one study to look at the explorer and those response for the efficacy and the safety. And here you can see the higher the explorer, we see the better the efficacy and also the worse of the safety. So based on this uh, ER relationship, actually we can project what's the probability for the key efficacy and the safety for the two, uh, compared to those levels. So from this prediction, you can see the 6.4 tend to have better efficacy. For example, ORR and the you know, best to tumor response, et cetera, and also have worse of the safety, higher incidence of the toxicities. So based on this benefit risk profile, in the end, the sponsor decided to pick the lower dose because there's a big concern on the interstitial lung disease. Um, so as a result, they used 5.4 mean per kg Q3 regimen to support the registration for the HER2 positive breast cancer. And lastly, I just want to briefly touch upon the modality. Uh, so I think the evolution here, I just show you the evolution of the biologics evolving over the time and the modalities. So in early uh, 80s, we mainly focus on replacement therapy, some of the therapeutic protein, uh, for example, insulin. But I think in the late, in, late 1990s, I think monoclonal antibody become increasing important modality to, to uh, for the therapeutic treatment across different indications. And for the last one and a half decade, I think we start to see more and more different modality. For example, ADC, T cell dependent by specifics. And uh, recently we start to see gene therapy, CAR T cell therapies and uh, personalized cancer vaccines, et cetera. And uh, because of this, uh, you know, continue, uh, you know, growing of this advanced therapy and the medical products we, uh, in European, we call ATM, ATMPS, uh, which is defined as the medicine for human use that are based on gene, tissue, and cell therapies. So I think basically including three categories. I in, in today's talk, I will mainly focus on the gene therapy medicines. One is the CAR-T, which is S vivo gene therapy, and the other is AVV-based gene therapy, which is in vivo gene therapies. And for US FDA, they also have similar office to review this type of product, but again, their scope is slightly bigger than the European. Um, and I, I, you know, I think in this case, we usually submit this type of product in the CBER. Uh, the center of biological evaluation on the research instead of CEDAR for the uh, for the larger molecule and the small molecule. And in the office of the tissue and advanced therapy, they will specifically review all these different products. So given limited time, I will mainly focus on CAR-T and AAV-based gene therapies. So first, I just want to share briefly what are the clean farm considerations for gene and cell therapies. Actually, to be trans, uh, you know, the science of clinical pharmacology remain the same for these newer modalities. So the goal for clean farm is still try to find the right dose for every patient, and the PKPD concept still the same. As Tommy already mentioned, the PK we try to understand what the body does to the drug, and you know, including for CAR T, even though for. Uh, you know, it's cell proliferation versus small and large molecule, they actually the body try to eliminate their drugs. So they just different process, but describe the how the body does to the drug. And the PD is what the drug does to the body. I think the both concepts are remain the same. The only thing is compared to conventional small molecule and large molecule, the gene and the cell therapy, they have quite different atomy and the PK characteristics, and also associated intrinsic and extrinsic factor that influence that process. So here I just want to highlight the biggest difference. For example, for CAR T, you know, they have the once they bound to the target antigen on the tumor. The CAR T has self proliferation. It's a living, um, living cells. It's not, you know, one molecule. They will try the body try to eliminate it from the body. And for AAV based gene therapy, it's kind of virus, right? So they basically follow the viral life cycle. So basically, the virus will take up by the cells and get into the nucleus from episomal double strand DNA. And then in here, it's quite stable. So the double strand DNA can get a transcription, become transgene mRNA, and it can also 
get translation, get transgene proteins. And if the, the, if the episomal double strand DNA is, is here, stable, so we will continue to produce transgene um, product. So with that consideration, the process, here are some of the similarities and difference between all these modalities. First, from structure and the size. So here I put all these sites, maybe the similar size on the slide, but in reality, they are very, very different. So the molecular weight for small molecules is usually around 500 Dalton. The best case should be lower than 1,000 Dalton. In contrast, for the larger molecule monoclonal antibody, is 150 kilo Dalton. And for genes and cell therapy, is much bigger. So it's, it's 26 nanometer for uh, recombinant AAV based, uh, you know, gene therapy. And for the CAR T, the T cells, which is around five to 10 micron in diameters. And also for the drug product, for small molecules, it's quite straightforward. It's exactly the chemical synthetic structures. And the, uh, the monoclonal antibody already start to introduce complexities. It's a single API active product ingredients with the same protein sequence, but however it's generated by the cell lines, they may potentially have slightly different of the post modifications uh, for this, uh, you know, same protein sequence. But again, still the same APIs. But for gene and cell therapy, they have a lot of different molecule and the component. For example, for the uh, a recombinant uh, AAVs, which is replication incompetent AAV. So we have viral capsid and also vector genomes inside. And also for the CAR T, which is basically T cells, it's a living cells with S vivo genetic modified, um, modified um, T cells. And also for autologous CAR T, the drug component actually can be unique for each individual or subject. So we don't have the same drug for each individual. And for the rod administration, small molecule usually we take orally. And, and for larger molecule monoclonal antibody, we do parenteral uh, dosing, for example, IV in the sub-Q, sometimes uh, IM, intramuscular injections. For gene therapy, we can do multiple rod administration, the IV infusion, uh, IM, but often we do local administration to tar the target tissue. For example, intracerebellar spinal fluid, we can inject there. Also the subretinal injections. And for cell therapy, usually it's IV infusion. And we have not seen any cases for the cell cure the IM. Dosing schedule, you know, for small molecule, large molecule, really repeated dosing. And for small molecules, QD, BID, given they have relative short half-lives. For MAPs, it's usually Q every week, those uh, once every two weeks or every three weeks, given they have reasonably longer half-lives. But for gene and the cell therapy, usually it's one-time dosing, single dose levels. Uh, given the much longer durability of the uh, molecule uh, within the uh, within your body, and the, from the analytical uh, perspective, um, for small molecule using uh, LCMS back to analyze the both parent and the metabolite, and the larger molecule we can use ELASA. Uh, recently, we can also use Affinity capture LCMS back to quantify the, the monoclonal antibody in the circulation. And for gene therapy, we need to look into multiple analyte. For example, vector DNAs, and we can use DDPCR. And then if there's a chest gene proteins um, in the circulation, we can use ELASA to measure it. And for CAR T, we can use DDPCR to look into the, uh, you know, DAs, the transfactor genes, but we can also look at the, using flow cytometries to look at surface expression of the receptors. So here are some of the additional atomy comparison for the small molecule, uh, you know, versus the gene and the cell therapy. I think in general, the classical atomy PK of the small molecule and large molecule general are not applicable to cell gene therapies. So in general, for small molecule, we have absorption where the GI, the solubility, permeability will uh, matters how much the drug will absorb. And for larger molecule, usually with those IV, and for sub-Q, usually we, the absorption is where the lymphatic system. But in general, for the monoclonal antibody, the bioavailability uh, for the sub-Q is usually quite consistent, ranging from 60 to 80%. 
and it's not applicable for cell and gene therapy given the raw administration. And for the distribution, small molecule, we know it's widely distributed and much bigger than the you know central volume of the blood. And for larger molecule, monoclonal antibody usually can find proximate uh, you know, plasma volume and have limited tissue distribution. And for gene therapy, it's quite a unique. Their biodistribution is usually well studied in the preclinical species. And the, the distribution will depend on the recombinant AVV serotypes, tropisms. So the different isotype of the capsid will depend, will, uh, will uh, you let you target specific organ, for example, muscle, or retina, or heart, et cetera. You need to use a different uh, capsid to target specific organ of interest. And for cell therapy, I think the distribution uh, is more mimic the T cell distribution. Uh, will distribute highly blood, uh, the organ well perfused with blood and also the tumor. Metabolism, again, for small molecule, we have phase one, phase two metabolism and the set of profile for 50, you really account uh, the metabolism for more than, uh, for approximately 75% drugs. But uh, however, for larger molecule, there's no metabolism phase one, phase two. It's more related to the catabolism of the protein where proteolytic degradation uh, going through endocytosis, phagocytosis, or target media clearance. And for gene therapy, uh, there's no metabolism or catabolism. It's more related to how the you know the uh, virus can get into the host cells from a uh, episomal double strand DNA for the express uh, transgene mRNA and the proteins. And for CAR T, also there are no metabolism or catabolism. It's mainly the CAR T cell was bound to target will proliferate. And for excretion, I think we well know for. Small molecule, we can excrete in the fecal, biliary, or renal, urine, et cetera. And for larger molecule, usually they will degrade it to small peptide and amino acid get to be reused or eliminated very renally. And for gene therapy, we usually don't do a lot of excretion study, but we do viral shedding. The goal here is not to evaluate the clearance because there's no mass balance, but the goal here is to want to make sure uh, that there's no tra transmission risk to other people if this uh, you know, gene therapy product was excreted uh, to the environment in the biofluid. So usually we will monitor the viral shedding in the blood, saliva, urine, sweat, or even tears. And you know, cell therapy, there's no excretion. And also the PK is quite unique, right? The small and the larger molecule, they usually not going to proliferate. They usually get into the body, they go to, they decline. And the matter especially, and the, with a shorter, relative short half life for small molecule usually in hours, for larger molecule in days, right? Because we have FCRM binding properties to prolong the half life for monoclonal antibodies. But for gene therapy and the cell therapy, they usually last for years and months, and they also have higher interceptor variabilities. And for small molecule immunogenicity, no immunogenicity issues larger molecule only antibody drug conjugate, but for gene therapy and the cell therapy, the immune response is very complex. There's an innate immune response and also adaptive immune response for both the, uh, the capsid transgenes and also the CAR T cells and also the transgenes. So it's a very complex immunogenicity for these novel modalities. So here I just want to show you some of the typical PK properties for different modalities. For small molecule, again, this is oral dosing. You can see the half-life, uh, you know, the, the time scale is hours, the you know, decay matter exponentially with shorter half-lives. And this is the typical monoclonal antibody PK and the half-lives in days. And then in comparison for the CAR T, we have distribution, expansion, contraction, and the persistence for months and years. And similarly for gene therapy, the blue one is the uh, vector DNA kinetics in the serum. You know, you can see there's a very interesting shape of the curve. And the other curve is uh, in the viral DNA in the different biofluid. And again, here, if you can detect soluble uh, transgene product, you can see the transgene product actually staying for a long time, for years, uh, you know, given that the stable transcription of the double strand DNA in the nucleus. 
So with that uh, different atomy properties, so what are the unique consideration for the first human uh, design for cell and gene therapies? Given there's a huge unknown for the gene transfections, so in general, we don't test cell and gene therapy in healthy volunteers. So we will test directly cell and gene therapy in patient. Um, and also for the first in human dose selections, again, this is only one dose, single dose treatment. So the patient only have one chance to receive the dose. So as a result, we, we not only, only need to consider the safety, we also need to consider to find the dose that may potentially bring some benefit for the, uh, for the patient. And there's two different methods to decide how we're going to decide the starting dose. One is the empirical allometric scaling based on the animal data for the um, minimum effective dose or pharmacological active dose or the MTD, you know, the maximum tolerable dose or maximum feasible dose if possible. Um, but however, there are also other ways because they also lack of understanding the translatability of the preclinical experiment, animal study or in vitro study. We can also, based on prior clinical experience with uh, cell and gene therapy and a similar product, so we can uh, decide what will be the starting dose. And also for autologous CAR T, we probably could not face the dose levels given the manufacturer feasibilities. We will test. For each dose level, we will specify the dose range which is versus specific dose levels. And again, you know, given the variability, so usually we do the dose escalation with a half log increment, uh, which is commonly used. So that's the overall consideration for the first in human dose selections. I will pause here uh, and I will transfer, uh, let Jesse to share with you the Clean Farm study for the investigational new drugs. So Jesse, do you want to uh, show your own slide or you want me uh, to uh, to walk you uh, to really forward uh, to walk the slide? Mm -hmm.